Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Greeting everyone. I hope you're all doing okay. Thank you all for joining us today for a very special night, our finale for the our actual nights uh, series, Ramadaniya Tiktwariya. And today is a very special night as well, as we have a quite a distinguished guest. Um, please welcome the uh, Wala, uh, Wala Cooperative Insurance is appointed actually, and the fellow of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, uh, Mr. Sayyid Raza Haider. Um, Thank you. We can just uh, start uh, immediately with our uh, first talking points. And we'd like to start, uh, uh, Mr. Raza, with your journey in the actuarial profession. Perhaps give us a brief about your personal journey to fellowship and uh, grasp, uh, to grasp about your uh, actuarial career in general. Yeah. Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this session. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very excited to be talking to uh, people who have who, who are the future of the profession that I am in, and uh, I'm I'm very uh, happy to see this. You talked about the actual journey. Uh, maybe I can start it later, but I want to say one thing is uh, I have been in Saudi Arabia in the actuarial field since 2007, and uh, and I can assure you that in 2007 2008 when I came in. I never knew that one day I would be talking to so many budding actuaries, uh, which is uh, which is very very uh, you know I would say heartening to see, which is very very positive. So the insurance industry and the actual profession is in the safe hand. I have no doubts about this. So uh, now coming to your question, Abdullah, uh, the journey. I started uh, 22 years ago in 1998. Uh, I started my career formally. I started taking the exams uh, 22 years ago. And uh, uh, why I landed up in this profession was more out of accident than any pre-planned, uh, you know, I would say move. Uh, you see, uh, there are two type of people. People, uh, when you uh, when you give them a bunch of numbers, you know, that one type of people they will get scared to look at that, and then there's another set who will get excited looking at those numbers, and their their brains will automatically start, you know. Uh, trying to understand, analyze those numbers. Uh, I'm probably the second part, the second, later part. And uh, I always knew that, you know, uh, I would be going into uh, a career which has more numbers and more analysis and more, uh, you know, quantitative parts to that. Uh, but, you know, when I stepped, when I uh, looked at this particular area, uh, I found out that, you know, uh, there's a thing called actuarial profession. Uh, it has uh, a very in-depth uh, application in certain specific industries like insurance, uh, but it doesn't have an application in the wider world. But wherever it's, it is relevant, it is really very, very relevant. So uh, if you compare that to, for example, accountancy, you know, accountancy is a very, very, uh, very strong profession, very noble profession. And it has application across various industries, across a whole spectrum of different uh, industries. Uh, compared to that, actual profession is very specific, but you know it's very in-depth as well. So I th I always wanted to be a specialist rather than a generic. I always wanted to be someone with uh, uh, you know a good sense of uh, numbers, and I uh, and and actual profession suited me. And I came into this uh, uh, as I said in 1998 with a view that, you know, I probably can contribute uh, to this profession. This profession has really moved uh, on, it's really evolved over the last 22 years, and I'm very happy to be, you know, to be part of this profession. Okay, that's uh, that's great. And uh, we know that you're also um, a fellow of the uh, Institute of Faculty of Actuaries. Is there a reason why you picked that institute? Yeah, so it's a very, very, very good question. Uh, I know, uh, not a lot of people pick IFOA these days here in Saudi Arabia. Even in my time, it was uh, the same same case. But let let me give you some uh, uh, I would say some of my insight. In all honesty, Society of Actuaries, Institute of Actuaries, both are very prestigious. Both are uh, equally equally you know I would say uh, uh, valuable. Uh, the examination uh, you know content is very similar. Uh, someone who qualifies as a fellow from Society is probably equal to the fellow of the institute in, in a lot of ways. 
uh, but there are uh, you know small differences you know uh, and uh, i actually started with society of actuaries i took my first exam from there uh, but then i moved to the institute of actuaries and the reason is that you know uh, i think i like the examination style of institute more it's more in depth uh, i believe i believe that you know uh, someone who qualifies from the institute has a greater uh, technical grasp of the things simply because of the way the examinations are held and the study materials are taught uh, there's uh, the learning materials is very tailored here uh, unlike society i don't know what's the current right now but at least in my days the learning material was very specific uh, you know written by the institute of actuaries themselves and you know uh, so it was something that uh, would teach us uh, you know the concept at a more granular level and I, i i enjoyed it to be honest you know i had my own hiccups in between uh, which you would expect everyone to have uh, but i enjoyed being part of the institute i enjoyed the course materials i think uh, uh, the uh, the concepts are are much more uh, you know in depth in case of institute uh, so that's why i chose and i don't regret it at all i uh, i would recommend anybody who comes in to you know uh, to choose this uh, uh, institute of actuaries as well is the profession that i belong to okay that's uh, that's great um also there's uh, there are a lot of in saudi currently uh, actuary managers or chief actuaries um but you're someone who's uh, considered as an appointed actuary and uh, how did you become an appointed actuary and why is there so few or at least hardly any appointed actuaries in saudi uh, i think uh, the uh I think one one reason is to do with the demand supply honestly speaking I think uh, we have a huge gap of demand supply at the fellow level uh, uh, you know so one that that is clearly one aspect uh, but I think uh, uh, to be honest uh, internal appointed actuary is a, is a very very uh, uh, useful thing to have uh, a lot of companies don't have it uh, and a lot of companies don't realize uh, the usefulness of that when you are setting the reserves of the company when you are pricing their product uh the more you are closer to the company the more you are attached at the ground level to the company the more benefit you can you can reflect into your into your work uh for example in claim reserving you know if you have a very good uh i would say uh, understanding of the claim processes in an insurance company this it really really helps a lot uh the company's business plan business risk capital as more of you uh, enter the profession as more of you qualify as more of you uh, you know come into this space we'll have more and more internal appointed actuaries and uh, it will definitely be a value addition and i also believe that with supply with supply uh, the companies will uh, you know start to realize the importance and uh, you know they will they will do that internal appointed actuary was wala back in 2009 and uh, we had a gentleman called hajis nazir at that time who was the internal appointed actuary uh, so uh, so so we have some precedents in the past but i expect that to be more and more uh, you know i would say uh, common as we move on in future okay uh, maybe we can uh, move on to the next uh, uh, agenda point which is uh, how the insurance industry in can you say uh, evolved Uh, we know that you've been working in the Saudi industry for over 13 years now and uh, so what, what how would you describe the changes that occurred in the insurance industry over that time uh well insurance industry uh when i came in in 2007 you know uh, it was the insurance industry was going through a very uh and uh, voted or you know being asked to uh, to discontinue and a new proper uh, regulatory environment was in place of course it was all new so it had its own embryonic uh, issues i look at the insurance saudi insurance industry in three parts there was an era pre 2013 and then there was a era from 2013 and then 17 to talk about these three separately pre 2013 was an era where uh, most of the companies were starting up they were trying to find their space they were trying to find their feet on the ground uh, we had all sort of challenges of course uh, 2008 uh, 9 financial crisis also was during that period uh, so we had we had our own sort of challenges and i don't think as, as an actuarial profession to hire actually and uh, uh, of course uh, you know as we move as as we as the company started to grow as the company started to grow as the industry started to grow 
we saw more and more uh, openness among the companies to you know to explore uh, internal actuarial resources uh, this went down until until uh, 2013 in 2013 there was a huge change uh, at the regulatory level where sama uh, you know said that look uh, the pricing and reserving has to be more streamlined and particularly for motor and medical and then they came up with requirements that you know uh, the actual pricing for motor and medical has to be in place and at the same time the reserves have to be more technically uh, you know set aside uh, with greater actuarial involvement so it changed everything it changed everything the way uh, companies would price the product the way companies would uh, you know uh, i would say set the reserves uh, the reserves got strengthened across the board for the insurance industry and that actually started getting you know introduced to the insurance uh, industry there were a lot of actuaries who got in, came into the industry and they added a lot of value. Uh, to be honest, I think uh, the actuaries who are working in the insurance industry are really adding, really doing a good job. Uh, in my view, they are really adding, adding good value. So from 13 to 17, this all went on. Of course, there are different schools of thoughts. Uh, there are people who believe that you know uh, the such kind of restrictive pricing and reserving regime uh, was not really uh, helping, and it should have been more open. Uh, yeah, you can have a debate on that. I'm not uh, going to you know go into that part. But I think uh, one silver lining I can take out of that era is that, you know, it allowed a lot of actuarial skills to be part of the company, uh, to go inside the company, into the pricing, into the reserving. And that's something that really has uh, helped uh, or benefited the insurance industry significantly. Now, then the third era, which is the 2017 onward, where, uh, and I think this, this era I like personally, because in this era, what Sama did was they started to open up they started to give more and more, uh, you know, empowerment to the uh, to the companies in terms of their setting their pricing and reserving. Uh, the management were made made more uh, accountable for the reserves. Uh, in the past, it was more actually. Uh, so now management was uh, getting more and more ownership of that. Uh, we had we saw the NCD model in the retail motor come into place, where the rating factors came into place. Uh, there's a lot of, and I can tell you, there are a lot of developing countries who still don't have the NCD model. So Saudi is, you know, ahead of them by some distance. And with only 12, 13 years of regulated uh, industry, that's actually a very, very good uh, development. So uh, this is where I think uh, the actual work was improved. Uh, actual work was more, it became more in-depth. Sama came up with a lot of requirements uh, uh, of, you know, reporting the reserve templates, the pressing templates and all those things. Uh, and it all, it, all, all of that led to more and more actuaries coming into the picture. So I, I'm, I, I think this era has been very fruitful, and uh, the stage is all set for the fourth era, which is going to be the future, where we are going to see IFRS 17 coming in, where we're going to see more of you guys coming into the industry, where we're going to see more and more, uh, uh, you know, development and advancements in the actuarial work. The, that's that's good. That's good. Hopefully, we can see even more of that in the future. Uh, maybe we can uh, move on to the next agenda, which is your experiences in uh, greenfield insurance startups. Uh, we know that over your years of experience in the actuarial spy space, you have um, basically helped in starting up new insurance uh, companies. Uh, so what was the process like? What uh, were the experiences gained from it? Uh, what can you tell us about them? Yeah, I, I think over the past 22 years, I uh, have had direct and indirect involvement with uh, three different startups, uh, three greenfield operations. All of them were greenfield. And uh, uh, it's 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 very rewarding, you know. It's a uh, it's a very different uh, experience to start with. Uh, today, if you walk into one of the established companies, uh, you know, uh, you probably uh, will f see all the structures in place, all the policies and procedures and everything in place. And all you have to do is to basically come in and make yourself part of that system. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you will add value to that. But first, you have to be part of that system. In the green field you set your own system you know so you really add your word or your value at the start uh, what i saw the, the biggest uh, i'll say the biggest challenge of the green field is that you know in any green field you know you're basically a new entrant in, into the market and uh, uh, a new entrant faces a lot of teething issues a lot of embryonic issues uh, he has to find his space in the industry he has to find his niche in the market and he has to find a name in the market and that requires a lot of hard work. That requires a lot of, you know, you know, uh, I would say innovations. Uh, you have to be 
uh, you have to be clever at times you have to be you know uh, ahead of the game at times uh, so that's that's very challenging actually that's not easy and particularly in today's uh, insurance industry in saudi i think any greenfield startup is going to be you know facing a lot of challenges it, the market is already maturing quite heavily so i think it is going to be a massively challenging for any greenfield startup now the biggest benefit of the greenfield that i personally believe is that you know uh, see as actuaries we work in our in our domains we work in our solos we we are in our shells uh, we know there is an underwriting department we know there is a claim department finance department risk management it so and we have our own set of interactions with them which is limited to an extent but when you are setting up the green field you are actually very very deeply engaged with all those departments you engage with the it departments you engage with the claims department with the underwriting department you are engaged with them setting up their policies procedures so you know what they are going to do and how they are going to do it so you actually be become part of you know deciding what needs to be done how needs to be done you set the strategic objectives of the company you set the visions and when you do that once you do that uh, and when the company starts uh, you are basically deeply embedded into that operation and uh, uh, a newcomer would probably only be able to step in into the system but you are the system you know you are develop the system you are part of that system and i think that experience uh, makes you learn a lot you learn a lot about the writing functions finance functions you learn a lot about different functions that is you know uh, difficult to learn in an established industry in, in an established company but in a startup you get a huge opportunity to learn so i would say greenfield teaches you a lot it challenges you a lot it tests you a lot uh, and uh, it creates uh, i would say it it shapes up your future it shapes up your your personality uh, to, to you know to deal with more and more challenges in the industry okay and uh, did you find any kind of um, uh, significant differences between uh, uh, starting up in in saudi or uh, uh, versus uh, other uh, other countries i think any any uh, every company have their own set of uh, challenges every com- country is at a different uh, landscape uh, in my personal view and again that's my personal view i think uh, saudi insurance industry right now do not need any more green fields they need consolidation they need companies uh, to you know uh, to merge and become bigger uh, at the moment what is happening is that you know uh, we talked about the, the evolution of insurance industry but what we have al- al- also seen is that you know by 2015 16 we have two types of insurance companies one is those companies who have really established themselves and they are leading the market look at the top 7 8 companies 9 companies by the gross premium they are the leaders of the market uh, and they are leading the company then there is other end where companies who are struggling uh, and i think uh, it's not healthy for the industry that we have uh, such a diverse you know a uh, range of uh, insurance spectrum i think what we need is we need the smaller companies to uh, to consolidate we need them to become big we need them to you know to merge together and start to pose a challenge and i think in my view if they do that the insurance industry itself will grow it's not that the insurance industry is a is a finite space where everyone will then snatch a piece of the pie i think it's only going to grow uh, we need more and more uh, innovation we need more and more expertise and i think uh, the you know uh, that consolidation has to happen now if that has to happen then the scope of green field at the moment uh, in the uh, in saudi space i have my you know i'm not very excited about it honestly speaking let me put it this way but if you compare that to other countries uh, probably in certain countries there is a lot of scope uh but then again there are certain countries where i think it's similar situation as saudi so you we we started we had a mushroom growth we need a consolidation once consolidation happens once instability happens then uh, there will be more scope for greenfield and there will be more scope for new companies to come in uh okay and um you you mentioned that in order for um, uh some kind of startups in order to initiate they need to have some sort of niche aspect um a name making a name for themselves what are the main drivers in order for that kind of startup to to succeed yeah i think uh, saudi industry is uh, you know almost 83 82 83% motor and medical and uh, most of the companies are you know, uh, 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 you know either uh, selling motor medical or both uh, 
uh, there is of course a, a PNC line, which we also call the GI general insurance line, uh, which is there, but I think uh, uh, usually largely driven by the reinsurance support with very less retention. Uh, I think uh, if you ask me that, do we need a new medical company? Probably not. Do you need a new motor company? Again, I have my doubts. But if some company were to come in and say that we want to really expand on the life spectrum, life is only 3%. And, uh, uh, and in all honesty, you know, uh, the way I look at it, life is 3% not because the, the industry doesn't have the scope. The industry has a lot of scope. Uh, life is 3% because the players have not been able to grow uh, to the extent which the industry deserves. And I think a good, strong uh, growth in this segment can really, really, you know, kickstart or jumpstart this, this, this part of the, uh, this segment of the insurance sector. So I think uh, when you say niche, this could be one of the niche. Uh, and you need, uh, you know, uh, the right products, you need the right, in life products, uh, I think in life insurance generally, I think uh, uh, more than the product, it's the distribution channel which is important. Uh, in general, in motor medical, it's the product. But in life, it's the distribution channel. So I think if someone comes in, if, if a new greenfield insurer come, comes in, uh, with a very strong distribution model or expertise and they want to deploy in Saudi Arabia, uh, that's one area where they can still succeed. Okay, that's, uh, that's interesting. We can, we can uh, go to the next um, agenda point, which is about um, the overall future of the actuary profession in both traditional and, uh, and uh, uh, non-traditional roles. Uh, every year, we see uh, new talent graduating and venturing into actuary works, especially here in, in, in Saudi. Uh, how do you see the actuary profession, or especially those professionals, um, uh, changing in the future or, or developing in the future? Uh, I think, uh, uh, well, there are multiple parts to this, so maybe I'll try to cover uh, each of them. Uh, first of all, uh, I still believe that there is a, a lot of demand that's going to come up for the uh, uh, for the actuaries generally, and for uh, you know the local actuaries in particular, uh, we have IFRS 17 coming up. IFRS 17 is uh, going to change the way. Uh, in fact, it's going to redefine the way uh, the insurance company statements are you know published and disclosed. Uh, and it's a massive change, you know. So uh, and in IFRS 17, uh, the actuarial involvement is going to multiply. Uh, I believe that there are a lot of actuaries who, who are going to be part of the insurance companies, even if it's not in the, uh, uh, I would say, the, uh, the traditional actuarial capacity, but maybe in the finance department, in the, in the underwriting department. So there are, there are people who are going to be, you know, uh, making their way into the insurance industry. That's for the, for the insurance industry as it is. Now, even within the insurance industry, I believe that, you know, uh, see, if I look at uh, people, uh, the students who graduate from King Fahd University or King Saud University, you have spent four years in the actuarial profession. The actuarial profession teaches you a lot about the insurance industry, about the way insurance generally works, and you are already having a sound academic uh, knowledge. I expect that even if you're not able to find your way into that traditional actuarial area, there are a lot of other areas within the insurance sector where you are going to be a preferred choice. Underwriting, for example, you know, underwriting, technical underwriting is an area where I, you know, see if, if I'm an insurance company, if I look at an underwriter, uh, and if I get someone with an actuarial background, uh, and with some, uh, and willing to work in, in the, in the underwriting, I think that's, that's a very, very nice combination to have. So, uh, underwriting is one area. Risk management is one other area. Risk management is definitely, I think, uh, in Saudi, it hasn't really taken off the way it uh, was expected but there's no reason why it cannot. Risk management is the other area. Finance, of course, uh, actually can now reside into the finance functions. So I see more and more integration of the actual profession, actual, uh, you know, or actual skills into those areas. Currently, the industry has uh, something like this, that you have different uh, departments working independently, and then you have one actual department sitting in the corner. That has to change. That has to change. That has to be more integrated. And I think uh, there's a lot of scope for the new actuaries to be play, to, to, to play in those areas. Now, other than that, let's talk about some non-traditional areas, which is outside the insurance industry. We have, uh, in Saudi, we don't have much of precedence, but if you go to the, to, to the developed world, you have actuaries working in 
banking industry, for example, they're working in the investment asset management space, they're working in risk management, and they're all doing very well. They're all, all, you know, making a name for themselves, they're making a name for the profession. And I don't think, I don't see any reason why this cannot happen in Saudi Arabia. There's every reason why you guys can go into non-traditional area and be equally successful. Uh, because the skills that you learn in your university, the skills that you learn in your exams, a lot of other areas need those skills. The only challenge, the only issue is, again, the demand supply gap at that level. Uh, and I believe that the supply will create a demand. We are at a, at a stage where more and more supply will create demand. Uh, so I expect that, you know, uh, we will see in future more actually going into non-traditional areas. You need to someone to break the ice to start with, you know, you need someone successful to go once and then automatically, you know, the door is open. So I think I, I do expect that uh, there's a scope for all of you coming up in the traditional areas, traditional actual areas, traditional non-actual areas, and then non-traditional areas. Okay, so so do you, do you predict any um, any non-traditional roles be flourishing within within in Saudi where uh, actuarial uh, graduates can can go to? Yeah, I, I think I, I can see two areas to be honest. I can see two areas. One is I I I expect and I predict that you know uh, the finance structure function will be more populated with actuaries for the insurance company, uh, which has remained a non-traditional so far. So I expect the finance you know, department to have two, three, you know, actual skills, actual uh, expertise within embedded within them. And this is aside from the traditional appointed actuary roles. So that's one area. And the other area, I do believe that, you know, asset managers uh, would be tempted to look at your profiles, to look at what we do, and they, they would be looking to give us, to, to put a bet on us. So I expect that in the next two to three years, I think that door is also going to open. Okay, uh, perfect. But uh, before we start in the uh, Q, start our Q and A, um, we're very interested to know what kind of recommendations do we have to all actuarial candidates here and those that are going to venture into the market. Well, uh, I think the first and the foremost uh, recommendation I will give to all of you, and it's and I usually give it by heart. You know, so when I say it, I I say it by heart. Please, please, please pass your exams be a fellow. Uh, I've talked to a lot of you. I know some of you have the capability of, you know, doing it in very quick time. Some of you have, you know, will take more time, but try to give it a full shot. Uh, I don't think uh, leaving it in between uh, is going to be, you know, uh, good for you. I think it's, I, I think you should go all out for it. Try to be a fellow. I, if I look at you, I, I feel excited. I get goosebumps because, you know, uh, at this stage in Saudi Arabia, people like you, I mean, if you become a fellow, you are hitting a jackpot. You are hitting a jackpot. How many Saudi actually, how many Saudi fellows you have? I can only name one. Uh, but I think there are a lot of others who are coming up. And this market has a capacity to absorb a lot more than, you know, what we have right now. So focus on the exams. Have a very clear mind. Make sure that you qualify. Make sure that you qualify, qualify as a fellow. That's the biggest single advice I would I would give to all of you. Okay, that's uh, that's great. And with that, we can uh, move on to the audience's uh, Q and A. Uh, and as you were talking, we've had a few of them come up. And uh, so we'll just start. Uh, we have um, Mr. Qasay asking, um, can you walk us through the process of pricing models? Or um, what he was asking is walk us through the pricing of motor and medical insurance, perhaps okay. maybe. Okay, okay, okay. So I, I didn't expect that to be uh, this much technical, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> okay, see, uh, uh, let, let's talk about motor. What we do is, how you do it. Basically, uh, you look at two things, first of all. You look at the frequency of the claims and you look at the severity of the claims. It is advisable at all times to model them separately. I know there are a lot of companies who model them together. Uh, this is what you call the burning cost basis. But I have always been an advocate of, uh, of you know, modeling them separately. Claim severity and claim frequency. And uh, you look at the past trends and you devise your frequencies 
you divide your severity on the basis of different cohort of the policies you know the cohort of the policies could be let's say for example by body type sedan suv you know all those things it could be by region it could be by uh, uh let's say age of the vehicle it could be by age of the driver so you have a lot of factors that you have to consider so you divide them and then you model the frequencies by looking at the past trends uh and this is where i think your actual risks start to come into play because when you look at the past frequency you have to make a call whether that past is a reflection of the future and whether there is an adjustment required and that adjustment this is where the actually uses his judgment and his experience so using that you come up with a frequency projected frequency for the future and similarly you do the similar exercise for the projected severity of the claims and once you have the severity and frequency you put the two together and you get what you call the burning cost and then you apply your loadings uh, and you you know you do that there are a lot of softwares available which does it for you which uses the glm principles uh, uh, you know uh, i think uh, you can look at them what they do is i think my i have i've always believed that glm is a better way to do it because through a software because what it does is that you know it sort of take into consideration the interrelations of each of the factors you know um, so uh, i think that you have to consider but the principle behind all of this is basically to model frequency and severity through a glm approach and then use it to project your burning cost and then your eventual gross premium by taking account of the expense loadings and all those things i do, i i i can go into detail of that but i don't think it we, we have time for that <laughs> it, yeah. yes we, we have a lot of time other questions so um we have a question from mr murari is asking uh, what are some suitable courses for beginner for uh, actuarial so actually so who are beginners and what's the eligibility criteria for the pre lm courses uh, okay uh, uh, if you're going from the society route uh, i don't think there's a a, a prerequisite i uh, not to my knowledge uh, uh, again i uh, probably i think uh, uh, for this question abdullah you are a better person to answer than me <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty yeah uh, but i think i don't think there's a pre requisite uh, uh, pre qualification requirement uh, you have to take the exams and you have to pass it the first exam is exam p which is the probability and uh, there are a lot of exam uh, so if you register with society of actuaries for example uh, you know uh, the gentleman on the screen abdullah can guide you with a lot of books so we have the we have the books and materials available uh, recommended reading materials available that you can use if you go for the institute of actuaries they usually ask for some sort of uh, you know pre qualification they'll ask you to share with them what qualification you have and then they'll make a call on you and usually you can buy the material from there directly so you don't have to look at any other material so you can buy the material you have to register for the exam and you have to pass the exams it's as simple as that <laughs> okay um uh, we have a question from mr faiz he's asking can any company issue a lower price offer than the actuarial price i'm guessing he means uh, for one type of insurance due to the customer not losing another type the other type will be profitable unlike the first type of insurance i i think he's asking if we can just go a lower lower price than the actuarial yeah yeah i think uh, uh, the answer is yes it is possible uh, however however now that's the fun part uh, you have to have number one a clear justification of doing it number two whoever gives that decision or takes that decision whoever takes that call uh, has to have the authority given to him by the board of the company to take that call and there's always a limit to which you can go down so the board has to have a authority dedicated to that particular individual which will be something like a maximum limit on which he can go and subject to that limit being a being not being breached and subject to you having a very clear documented justification the answer is yes Okay um we have a question from Mr Rakan uh he's asking what do you think is the best country to work in in the middle east as an actuary of course saudi of course saudi <laughs> no doubt about it do you have any doubts about it no 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 <laughs> as an actuary absolutely no doubt about it <laughs> uh, okay okay then uh we have uh, another question from uh, sara who is asking what's the role of an actuary regarding solvency is it implemented just for insurance company or any company well, solvency uh it's it's a very interesting question i must say because see uh, solvency banks have solvency investment companies have solvency any any company would have solvency you know and actually uh, and insurance companies are no different you know solvency in simple word is that you know uh, in a very layman term that your your assets 
have to be higher than your liability and some extra margin in case things go wrong. So if you breach liability plus that margin, then you you have a solvency issue. Actuaries uh, have a very very uh, I would say important role to play here because actuaries don't look at the solvency, but their decisions, uh, their moves, their uh, you know I would say steps and whatever that they do actually has an impact on future solvency. So uh, it's very important that every actuary should project forward the, the solvency of the company and uh, you know so when we're making a decision regarding the reserving or the pricing it's always good to test out its possible impact on the solvency because you may be solvent today but you know uh, solvency can go down going forward and in fact uh, the saudi uh, regulation also requires that if an appointed actually sees that you know there is the, uh, that any particular company is going to have a solvency issue in the forthcoming future then he has to report that to the board and he has to report uh, and the board will have to then report to sama to the regulator so the actuary has to be you know vigilant about the solvency he has to keep a very close eye on how the assets and liabilities are developing and if he sees a trend getting you know deteriorated then he has to step in so yes it's a very important role to play okay um we have a question from mr albadar uh, he's asking can you please give an idea on how it is different to work as an actuary in an insurance company rather than a consulting company okay okay uh, i spent 9 uh, years in consulting and uh, almost like uh, uh, you know another 13 years in the insurance industry so out of 22 that's my division so i've worked in the in the consulting space and i've worked in the insurance space both have their own advantages both have their own disadvantages see in consultancy what you do is you get to work on a, a, a huge variety of projects huge variety of work you uh, for one client you'll be working on pricing for the other client you'll be working on solvency for someone you'll be working on the ifr 17 so you you name it you know and there are specific business plan for example there are specific requests that comes in so you get to you get to have a flavor of a lot of areas and a lot of countries as well you know because uh, a lot of consultancies are you know not just confined to their geographical location so they they work in the uae they work in the saudi they work in you know xyz so you get to to uh, to taste uh, the flavor of a lot of jurisdiction a lot of different variety of work uh, which uh, is actually very very uh, lucrative to look at at the same time the depth at which you go is not that great you know working in insurance company you are actually right at the middle of of, of the show you you are in the company you know so you are seeing not just making decision but but you are also seeing how the decisions are spanning out in practice how it is impacting day to day operation of the insurance company uh, and by being very close to the operations uh, you actually learn a lot personally when i came into the insurance industry i believe that i learned a lot more about the insurance than what i did in the consulting space uh, so uh, it's i think both of both are very good uh, if you have to let's say develop if you were to pick your career and i would say that you start with the consulting but then you find your way into the insurance industry because the consulting will give you the initial jump start but you should come in into the insurance industry to really be in the, in the middle of the show okay that's uh, that's great i have a a question from mr mathias i believe uh and he's asking what challenges will um, actually have in the coming years in saudi and will they be regulatory uh well i think uh, uh the I, i think the the, the biggest to, to be honest you know uh, the the industry is developing the industry is uh, uh, growing the the nature of work that we do is improving with the passage of time we are having more and more sophistication uh, i expect that more and more uh, softwares and techniques will come into play and uh, the challenge that i see is that you know uh, in any insurance industry uh, the development of actuaries is a very very uh, structured business you know so you have like some experienced actuaries at the top and then there's a very very good line going down so very experienced experience and then you have intermediate actuaries right up to the student level at the moment you have a, a, you know a, a vacuum in a lot of uh, uh, spaces so you you have a lot of vacuum at the senior level you have a vacuum at the mid level but then you have a lot of supply coming up so this supply is going to come up and eventually fill that vacuum but for these people 
the kind of guidance and the kind of uh, you know i would say support or the kind of downward uh, uh, learning that we would otherwise get in other jurisdiction you, they probably will not have that so that's one challenge i see uh, but i'm also sure that you know uh, because i've worked with some of you uh, these are some brilliant talents to be honest and i think uh, uh, by sheer skills you can overcome that don't underestimate the talent uh, don't underestimate the uh, the challenge but do not underestimate the talent as well okay uh we have another question from mr saif he's asking as an actually an insurance company can i doubt or change the decisions taken by the risk manager towards a new client or a new business okay okay well i think uh, uh it's always healthy to have alternate views um, you know uh when i actually say that i think this is how it should happen uh he can be wrong as well uh, he can have a different view so i think uh, a successful robust organization is one where it allows alternate views to develop and flourish and actually should always be challenged i have always believed that you know uh, actually should be challenged if uh, if he has a certain view if he believes that a certain client let's say i i, I assume he's talking about the pricing in any very particular context so if he believes that a certain risk has to be priced in a certain way uh, don't just take it on on the face value i think uh, pricing eventually ha- is the responsibility of the underwriter this is how it should be and underwriters should take the ownership of that so they should be challenging the actuaries they should be you know uh, asking questions and uh, they should be convinced that you know uh, 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 the price that they have taken from the actuary they should be convinced that it is really an appropriate price okay um we have a question from mr manik who is asking uh, most of the insurance companies in saudi arabia rely in uh, on external actuaries to do the reserving and pricing projects how working in those companies will add to my knowledge in the reserving and pricing yeah i, I think uh, as i said uh, it will add to your knowledge of course absolutely it will add to, uh, add to your knowledge uh, you will be and most of those companies are also operating in other jurisdiction as well so you will get to to you know have a taste of other jurisdiction other markets as well so it will definitely add to your uh, uh, you know uh, uh, to your expertise and uh, as i said uh, ideally if it's possible uh, i would recommend a new person to you know uh, uh, be excited about the consulting assignments and you know make an entry from there but eventually come to the insurance industry uh okay uh, we have a question but he didn't mention his name He's asking, do you think that mer- mergers can generate more actuarial opportunity, opportunities for actuaries? Yeah. W- what's the name of the gentleman? His name is iPhone, so there is no name. Okay. <laughs> well, Mr. iPhone is absolutely right. I think it's, it's a very good question. Very good question. Uh, I hope Mr. Samson has a similar question. <laughs> but but I, I think, see, uh, what, what is going to happen when, when, when merger happens? When merger happens, you get more and more stronger companies. So you convert... the small i would say weaker companies and make them stronger bigger companies and stronger bigger companies uh, you know uh, have more capacity to uh, to have actual uh, you know involvement uh, i i think i think the bigger companies will always have more requirement for actuaries will always have a scope for more value addition from the actuaries and as the merger happens the work will grow I personally believe that consolidation will be good for the actuarial profession. I know I have heard some arguments that you know if consolidation happens the number of insurers will go down and then it means that the actuaries will be lesser required. I don't agree with that. I think when the merger happens you will see more requirement for the actuaries coming up because the bigger companies will have more and more scope uh, for value addition where you can actually go and contribute. Okay, perfect. Uh we have a question from Mr. Adil. He's asking how to cover the two scopes while studying actuarial studies i think he means the two scopes of being an actuary and finance actuary and finance yeah uh, i i'm not sure what uh, what is the question i think what is uh, what what is he trying to ask uh, can you repeat the question yeah he's asking how to cover the two scopes while studying actuarial studies uh, ie actuary and finance he's asking basically um, how how uh, uh, seemingly diff- different topics how how would how would you merge between those two but uh, yeah yeah i think uh, uh 
I'll try to answer this. I uh, probably only partly understand the question. Uh, so my apologies if I uh, don't satisfy your question. Um, I think uh, actually, uh, see, one thing that you have to keep in mind that uh, if you want to be an actuary, you have to study and pass the exams. And passing the exams, I'm not going to fool you. I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest. Passing the exams requires hard work, requires commitment, requires time. And that time has to come out from the 24 hours that every one of us have. So you have 24 hours in a day and you have to take that time out. And this is where the first bit of balancing is required. If you have to become an actuary, you have to commit a certain portion of your time every day towards studying. Uh, in the same way, in the same way, when you work in an organization, you know, uh, you have to basically balance between the need for, you know, passing your exam and the need for to develop the work and deliver the work. Uh, now, to, uh, so that's the background. Now, to answer your question, I think balancing is what we have to do for the rest of our life, uh, or at least up to the point that we can become a fellow. Uh, we have to, to uh, you know, to balance between a lot of uh, competing objectives. Uh, and in the studies, there is an actuarial part and there's a finance part. There's an economic part. Uh, so you have to have uh, a good understanding of each one of them. You have to find a way to balance your understanding and learning of these, these skills. Uh, I don't know if this is what you were asking, but I've tried to answer this. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Malik as well, and he's asking, what kind of softwares do you, softwares do you use in the reserving, pricing, and processing the data? I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I can't name the software. So I think it's uh, 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 unfortunately I can't name one particular software. I don't think it's it will be fair for me to you know take a name because there are competing softwares available in the market. I think you have to pick and choose what is best for you. I think you more open, which allows me to you know uh, include my judgment into the reserving process. Uh, there are softwares which are more closed. So I don't think I can pinpoint one software. I think it, it will depend on your, your requirements and your choice. Okay, perfect. And we have, uh, I believe that might be the last uh, question we have, is that um, why would you recommend becoming an actuary for those who are still vegetating to go into their college life or still deciding on what path to choose? Uh, I think it's a wonderful profession. I think it's a wonderful profession. I've got like 22 years uh, in this profession and I have lived every day of that. Uh, I am glad that I was, I decided to become an actuary. Uh, I, uh, I would recommend that, you know, this is a profession that is, you know, that you should take it up, take up. However, I have a few word of cautions. Number one, I firmly believe that, you know, uh, not uh, everybody has the same skill set. So see, every person has a very unique skills. Nobody has come in the world without any particular uh, X factor to, to, to him or her. So I think you need to understand your X factor. Uh, if you love numbers, if you like, if you don't get scared with the numbers, let me put it this way, uh, then yes, I would say that you explore this profession. Uh, there would be some of you who would otherwise be a very good doctor. I wouldn't recommend them to become a, uh, an actuary because you probably are better of being a doctor. Uh, this world needs good actuaries, but they also need good doctors. They also need good engineers. So I would say that, you know, uh, if you have uh, what it takes to become an actuary, which is basically number one, you have to have a good sense of numbers and you have to have a good, uh, you know, uh, strategic uh, way of thinking. Uh, I would say that, you know, yes, this is a profession for you. I would recommend you come in. I would also caution you that you will need to put in the hard work. Uh, I will be, I, I'll not lie to you. I think it needs a lot of hard work. You need to study. You need to pass exams. Exam passing is not easy. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes commitment. Uh, if you are ready for all of that, then I can tell you that there's no better profession than actual profession for you. That's, uh, that's perfect. And with that, we'd like to um, end our session today and thank uh, all of you for joining us today uh, for the finale of our actuary nights, Ramadan Yat Tuaria. And we'd like to thank you, Mr. Uh, Raza Haider, for joining. And, thank uh, you most very much. Yes, and most importantly, um, uh, again, thank you for the contribution to this event. Uh, this is our last night in the series. And uh, do please stay in touch in the Actuary and Science Club. And I would like to give a special thanks to those in the Actuaries Club who are working behind the scenes, 
So if you would like to um, connect with us at any time, you can just go to our Twitter, KPPM ASC. And um, with that, uh, I'd like to say good night and thank you all. Good night and thank you very much. Thank you very much for, showing, uh, for turning up today. It's a pleasure uh, being with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.